action here. We see three mysteries coming, one right after the other, and they are linked. He says, the mystery of the Eucharist is basically or ontologically joined to the mystery of the Incarnation, just as the Incarnation is joined to the Trinity. The Incarnation is the presupposition and explanation of the Eucharist, just as the eternal generation from the bosom of the Father is the presupposition and explanation of the Incarnation. Now that sounds pretty complicated. Regarded, the Incarnation is the stepping forth of God's Son into the world. These three mysteries disclose a remarkable similarity and relationship with each other. All three show the same Son of God, first in the bosom of the Eternal Father, whence he receives his being, the second in the womb of the Virgin Mary, through which he enters the world, and the third in the heart of the Church, where he sojourns by enduring universal presence among men and unites them to himself yet he remains ever hidden from the natural eye and the, of the body and the soul. In all God's visible creation, we cannot find the generation of his Son, nor in the humanity of the Son can we discern the hypostatic union of the two natures, nor in the Eucharistic species can we discover the body of Christ spiritually present. In all three forms, only supernatural revelation only faith in that revelation can enable us to recognize the Son of God. And this is a faith by which we do not simply grasp some object lying beyond the reach of our reason, but must break through the barriers thrown up by the limitations of human thought. They flow from each other. And finally, you could say to me, why? Why something so intimate that I should eat the flesh of the Son of God? These are the words that Jesus uses in John 6. He used a Greek verb which means to crunch, to munch. Why? Because he has not simply called us to the forgiveness of sin. He has not simply called us to life after death in heaven. He has called us and St. Augustine and following St. Paul is so powerful on this. He has called us to be united with him in eternal life. The Lord said it at the Last Supper, Father, that they would be one in us, I in them, you in me, that they would be one in us. And this marvelous, mysterious participation in the Paschal Mystery shouts out to us that we are called to be united in eternal life in the love and life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Groeschel. Before I commence, may I preface my remarks by recording my grateful thanks to the Young Serens Community Group here in Dallas. They have made my coming across to this lovely country possible. And so I want to say to them, thank you. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you brought me over. Um, and I do appreciate it very much. And I think we should give you a hand clap. I'm here to present the Protestant Reformed position on transubstantiation of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, if you like. And I want to say that I, because I have been a Catholic myself, I know that the Catholics hold the doctrine of the Eucharist very dearly to your hearts. You will be shocked by what I say this, after, this morning, but I would ask you to just understand that I'm presenting the Protestant position. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here to pull your faith apart. I'm here to present what we believe to be the truth 
as presented in the scriptures. The Lord's Supper. It is almost impossible to enter into the meaning of the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist without some knowledge of the nature of the Jewish Passover feast, especially in the manner in which the various elements of the Passover meal followed each other. The main features of the Passover feast, after checking for any leaven, were as follows. Now remember that the Lord's Supper was instituted after the Passover meal. There is a link. Now this is what happened at the Passover feast in Old Testament times. First of all, there was a prayer of thanksgiving by the head of the house. Then there was the drinking of the first cup of diluted wine. Secondly, there was the eating of the bitter herbs as a reminder of the bitter slavery which they experienced in Egypt. Thirdly, there was the son's inquiry. Why is this night distinguished from all other nights? And then there was the father's reply, either narrated or read. Fourthly, the singing of the first part of the Hallel, which was Psalms 113 and 14. And then there was the washing of the hands. And it was at this stage where Jesus put on a towel and washed the feet of the disciples. Fifthly, the carving and eating of the lamb together with unleavened bread. The lamb was eaten in commemoration of what the ancestors had been commanded to do on the night when the Lord smote all the firstborn of Egypt and delivered his people. The unleavened bread was in commemoration of the bread of haste, as it was known, and eaten by the ancestors. Sixthly, the continuation of the meal, each eating as much as required, but always last the lamb. And then there was the drinking of the third cup, for there were four cups at a Jewish Passover. And it was at the drinking of the third cup, which was known as the cup of blessing, that the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. And then finally, there was the singing of the last part of the Halal, which was Psalms 115 and 118. Now, what did the Passover mean for the Jew? Remember, it was still instituted in the land of slavery. It was instituted in Egypt. But we know from Deuteronomy 16 and verse 2 that it was later connected to the sanctuary. Well, it was celebrated. It celebrated the culminating act of redemption by God in the judgment upon the land of Egypt. All the firstborn in the land of Egypt were slain. And uh, God passed over those who had the blood of the lamb applied to the lintels and to the doorposts of, the, uh, of their houses. So there was the Passover celebrated the deliverance from Egypt. It thus had a national significance. The Paschal lamb had symbolical significance. The lamb was slain and the Levites, by the Levites and the blood sprinkled by the priests. This taught the people that without the shedding of blood, There is no forgiveness or remission of sins. It was also a meal. The lamb was roasted whole and eaten with unleavened bread. It was celebrated in the expectancy of victory. God would deliver them from the oppressor, and thus it was a spiritual victory, but also a material victory. So there was deliverance and redemption. There's the past, there's the present, and there was the future looking towards victory. The New Testament, of course, ascribes to the Passover typical significance in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and thus it was a sign and seal of the deliverance from bondage of sin and communion with God in the promised Messiah. It looked forward to the great sacrifice which would be brought about by Almighty God in the fullness of time when Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would be slain. It was but natural, therefore, that the real Lamb when the real Lamb of God made his appearance and was at the point of being slain, that the old symbols and type would disappear. Through the death of Jesus, the middle wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentile had been broken down, and so salvation was extended to the world. Now, in view of this, it was quite natural that the Passover, a symbol of national flavor, should be replaced by one which carried no implications 
of nationalism. Now, one of the most obvious facts about the Lord's Supper is that it was celebrated at the Passover at the Passover meal. The continuity of the renewed or new covenant with the old was marked by linking the two rites. So by historically linking the Passover and the Lord's Supper so closely together, Jesus made pretty clear that what was essential in the first was not lost in the second. Both point to him, the only and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of his people. So the Passover pointed forward to this, the Lord's Supper looks back to the death of Christ. Now after Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to them and said, this is my body given for you. What did the Jewish disciples understand by those words of Jesus? Did they as Jews really think that what Jesus was saying that they should literally eat his body? That would have been strange to a Jew because that would have been cannibalism. cannibalism. You see, the Jewish fathers followed the same ritual at every meal and also at the Passover feast. They always broke bread. When our Lord fed the 5,000 and the 4,000, he took the bread and he broke it. It was a thing that was done by the head of the family or by the host. This is my body. In the Greek, the word this, tauta, is in the demonstrative. And so Jesus was demonstrating something. This, I'm demonstrating something to you. This is my body being given for you. The words again, being given, in the Greek, is a present passive participle. And it relates not to what man does, but to what God does. So the Lord's Supper has to do with what God does for us, not what we are presenting to God as a sacrifice. It is therefore not what the priest does, nor what he says or utters. It, was, it is what God does for us in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. It is a thanksgiving meal. To say that Jesus was actually stating that the portions of bread which he handed to his disciples were identical with his physical body, or that they were at that moment being changed into his body, would ignore, of course, the fact that Jesus was standing there in his physical body before his disciples for all to see. A fact that the words of Jesus, I have earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer, written in Luke 22:15, indicates that Christ's suffering was emphatically not on the table, but later on the cross. To accept a literalistic interpretation of the words of the institution is to claim that he who reclined at the table held his complete body and every drop of his blood in his own hands. In other words, Christ was holding another Christ in his hands. And every time a disciple broke off a piece of bread, another Christ appeared despite the fact that Jesus Christ himself was instituting the Lord's Supper. That is a type of polytheism. And in the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The cup represents the new covenant that Jesus ratifies with his blood. The old was passing, Jesus was instituting the new, the old Passover was passing, Jesus had instituted the New Testament Passover, if you like, as Jesus is called the Passover Lamb. He sprinkled his blood upon his people, and uh, that was at the Passover, the, the priest sprinkled the blood on the people as, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you, and that was in Exodus. And animal blood was sprinkled for the first covenant, Christ's blood was sprinkled for the second covenant. Some of the things which uh, signi are signified in the Lord's Supper. It is a commemoration. I really do not like the word memorial because a memorial is for someone who's dead. Christ is still alive. It is a commemoration. Do this in 
remembrance of me, as oft as you shall do it, and therefore it is not only just a commemoration, it is a community meal. It is a symbolic representation of his death. So in the Lord's Supper, there is the, the Lord is telling us that we must look to, our look to our, the deliverance which he's given to us. There is redemption. The, fact, the central fact of redemption prefigured in the Old Testament sacrifices is clearly set forth by means of the symbols of the New Testament. My body given for you and shed, my blood shed for many point to the fact that the death of Jesus is a sacrificial one for the benefits of his people. It symbolizes the believer's participation in the crucified Christ. We not only look at the symbols, we feed upon them. Figuratively speaking, we eat the flesh of the Son of God and we drink his blood. That is, we symbolically appropriate the benefits secured by the sacrificial death of Christ. It represents the effect of this act as giving strength and joy to the soul. And just as bread nourishes our body, so Christ sustains and quickens the life of the soul. The Lord's Supper also symbolizes the union which we have with other believers. It speaks of our deliverance from sin by the death of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we also look forward to the time of victory. Do this until I come. When Jesus shall come again, and when we hope that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So it speaks of God's final victory over evil. So the, so the Passover, the Lord's Supper sets forth freedom, and this includes freedom from the slavery and the captivity of the power of sin, Satan, and self. The consequences of the Passover was the preparation and summons to take over the promised land and to dispossess the ungodly inhabitants in the land of Israel or the land of Palestine. The Christian Passover is similarly followed by the Great Commission in Matthew 28, the mandate to go out and command all the world for Christ the King, making disciples of all nations. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Did the disciples understand Jesus to mean that that was his blood and that they were to drink it? Leviticus chapter 3 verse 17 and chapter 7 verse 26 tells us that it is against the law for any blood to be eaten. And as Jesus Christ was a Jew, and as he had to fulfill the law, he was not allowed to drink blood. As Jews, the disciples knew the law. The second commandment was, you shall make no image nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or under the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor worship them. In the Old Testament, remember when Moses came down from the mountain after fasting for 40 days? And they had made a golden calf. And Aaron said to Moses, oh, we just threw the gold into the fire and out came the golden calf. And the covenant people of God were worshipping God. They said, this is the God that delivered us from Egypt. They were worshipping the golden calf. Now, in principle, it's the same as far as Protestant theology is concerned. The Roman Catholics are looking up to that little wafer, and after the words of consecration, it is supposed to be the body and the blood of Christ. And they are actually worshipping something which is made by hands, and they are worshipping an idol as far as the Reformed um, theology is concerned. I'm just presenting to you the Reformed theology. So just as they worship the golden calf in the Old Testament, so yeah, in after the... Uh, of, uh, uh, since Christ has been born, there have been many who are worshipping a little Eucharist, which they say is the body of Christ, which is man-made, and which to us is an idol. <clears throat> 
it's, uh, I just want to bring you some texts as far as literal interpretation is concerned. In Isaiah 40 verse 6, all flesh is grass. If the literal interpretation is insisted upon, then I must believe that all flesh is actually and literally grass. And then I must believe that every bishop and pope and everyone else is a tuft of grass. All flesh is grass, and then I must believe that even the flesh of Christ is grass. For he, made, he was made in the likeness of man, and then that would mean that every communicant would be eating grass as he remembered the Lord's Supper. That is if I take it literally. In the Protestant Reformed circles, we interpret it symbolically. In Matthew 24, and verse 26, Jesus said, If they say, Lo, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. The Greek word here denotes literal, literally boxes, cupboards, pixies, corners. It is then, is it right then for anyone who puts the Eucharist back into that little pixie, into what is known as the tabernacle, the wafer, the consecrated wafer, back into the little box to be carried around and then worshipped? In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, As the lightning comes from the east and from, from the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, if Jesus appears upon the altars, where is the lightning that comes from the east and from the west? If we say that he appears bodily. In Luke 22 and verse 15, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I supper before I suffer, and indicates that Christ's suffering was emphatically not at the table, but afterwards on the cross, and therefore Christ cannot literally suffer at the Mass, because it is a sacrifice. There is no literal body. In Luke 24, Jesus said to Thomas, Behold my hands and my side, handle me and see. Now, as Protestants, we don't believe in transubstantiation, and therefore we say to the Roman Catholics, produce the body of Jesus so that we can handle it, touch it, see it, and then perhaps we so-called unbelieving Thomases will believe. The host which the priest holds in his hands has neither hands nor feet, neither bones nor nerves. It is not the bodily presence of our Lord has that host any trace of the wounds of Christ? Has it, any, has it any features which are demonstrative of the characteristics of a natural body? If I speak to it, will it answer me? Will it say, handle me and see and believe? When I look at the wafer, I see no resemblance whatsoever to the body and blood of Christ. What I do see is just a host. And all the faith in the world could not charge my belief that what I see is a wafer and not the body and the blood of Christ. Now, as far as the Protestants are concerned, it would require the most circumstantial and the looser demonstration to show in the very teeth of many scriptures that Christ's body and blood is present in a way in which he's supposed to be present. Jesus, in John chapter 19 and verse 30, shouted out triumphantly, Tetelestai! It is finished. And what he meant by that was that his sufferings were completely finished. Well, if his sufferings were completely finished, how come he's offered again as a sacrifice there at the Mass? In Acts chapter 3 and verse 21, whom the heaven must receive until the time for, the establishing, for establishing all that God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. The Reims or Reims and Douay versions on these passages are substantially, if not verbatim, the same. The passage says that the heavens must receive our Lord until the times of the restitution of all things. But according to Roman Catholic teaching, Christ leaves heaven bodily, soul with bones and nerves, and appears on every altar throughout the world after the priest has announced or pronounced the words of consecration. And so to us as a Protestant, whereas the scripture says that he will stay in heaven until the restitution of all things, 
We cannot believe the Roman Catholic teaching, which tells us now that the Lord is bodily present in the Eucharist. In Romans chapter 6, and I'll read it. Romans chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death has no longer mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Christ will never die again. And yet, according to Roman Catholic teaching, they present that sacrifice in the Eucharist, the sacrifice that Christ has died again. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 24, Jesus said, No more will I drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew in the kingdom with my Father. He said these words after. He said, This is the blood of the new covenant. Therefore, if we take a literal view of what Jesus said, that means that Christ is saying he's going to drink his own blood in heaven above. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, from now on we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew and regarded Christ from a human point of view, we cannot regard him thus any longer. And if transubstantiation be correct, then the apostle must be wrong. For he very definitely teaches that we no longer regard Christ from a human point of view, which is exactly what the Roman Catholics teach in their Mass, in the transubstantiation. Again, Paul says in Colossians 3.1, If you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. That is where Christ is, we believe, as Protestants. And yet, if there is to be coming or any linking together, we would be required to believe that Christ is bodily present in that little wafer. Hebrews 1 verse 3 teaches that after Jesus made purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. His work of redemption was complete. How then can, we be, can it be said that they are offering Christ's body and blood under the species of bread and wine to God the Father, who has already accepted the once for all completed sacrifice of Jesus by raising him from the dead. Hebrews 2 verse 17. Jesus was in all points made like unto his brethren, and therefore he cannot be in more, place, in, in more than one place at one time with regard to his body. To say that Christ is present bodily on all the altars of Rome is to destroy the nature of a true human body. Christ was in all things made like unto his brethren, in every peculiarity and feature and characteristic of real humanity, sin only excepted, of which he was clearly and utterly void. Now, if Christ was made like unto us, then he cannot be bodily here in one place and bodily present in another place. If his body was like ours, then Christ's body can only be in one place at one time. Hebrews 9 verse 9, he entered once for all, into the holy place, taking not the blood of bulls and goats, but taking his own blood. And again in verses 24 and 26, Christ has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. No more does Christ have to be sacrificed. He's been sacrificed once, and for all, which is the most definite teaching of the letter to the Hebrews. Again in uh, Hebrews 9, verse 28, just as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear the second time. He doesn't have to be offered more than once upon any altar or upon any table. And then just some objections, which we as Protestants, I'm just saying these are some of the, the problems, shall I say, which we as Protestants have. If we are to uh, link up with Rome, which I'm sure that most Protest a lot of Protestants won't, particularly when it comes to the doctrine of transubstantiation. 
please don't think that I'm irreverent. I'm not here to, to, to make fun. I'm not here to destroy any man's faith. I'm letting you know how we as Protestants look at it. The priest takes the wafer and he says the words of consecration. And after the words of consecration in that little wafer is supposed to be the body and blood of Christ. God created by a human. He then worships that humanly created God and then he eats it. <laughs> 